Everywhere, people are in a hurry. Jet-powered planes speed their precious human cargo across broad continents and vast oceans. Modern freeways carry millions of automobiles in a seemingly endless stream. Does this pulsating, mobile ribbon of humanity ever come to a halt? When compared to eternal verities, the questions of daily living are really rather trivial. What shall we have for dinner? Is there a good movie playing tonight? Where shall we go on Saturday? These questions pale in their significance when times of crisis arise or when life's candle dims and darkness threatens. The soul of man reaches heavenward, seeking a divine response to life's greatest questions. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where do we go after we leave this life? These questions transcend mortality. They embrace eternity. Where did we come from? This query is inevitably thought, if not spoken, by every parent or grandparent when a tiny infant utters his first cry. One marvels at the perfectly formed child, the tiny toes, the delicate fingers, the beautiful head, to say nothing of the hidden but marvelous circulatory, digestive, and nervous system, all testify to the truth of a divine creator. We note that inspired poets have for our contemplation of the subject written moving messages and recorded transcendent thoughts. William Wordsworth penned the truth, our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting, the soul that rises with us, our life star, hath had elsewhere its setting, and cometh from afar, not in entire forgetfulness, and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory, do we come from God, who is our home. Heaven lies about us in our infancy. Another writer described a newborn infant as a sweet new blossom of humanity, fresh fallen from God's own home, to flower here on earth. When such far-reaching matters are contemplated, we reflect upon the helplessness of a newborn child. No better example can be found for total dependency. Needed is nourishment for the body and love for the soul. Mother provides both. Parents gazing down at a tiny infant or taking the hand of a growing child ponder their responsibility to teach, to inspire, and to provide guidance, direction and example. Well might parents ask, what lessons shall we teach? What truths are of greatest consequence? Faith is the first principle to be taught our precious children, and abiding faith in God our eternal Father, and in His Son Jesus Christ. Beyond the teaching and learning of faith, we emphasize the principle of repentance. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions so iniquity shall not be your ruin, declared Ezekiel of ancient time. His plea was for people everywhere and in all times to cease from doing wrong and turn to righteous living. Next we hearken to the counsel of the Lord to Nicodemus. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. We recognize the example of the Lord Jesus Christ in being baptized by John in the River Jordan. We follow the pathway he marked. We know the necessity for the laying on of hands by those who have the authority that we might receive the Holy Ghost. When I reflect on the race of life, I remember another type of race even from childhood days. When I was about 10, 
My boyfriends and I would take pocket knives in hand and from the soft wood of a willow tree fashion small toy boats with a triangle-shaped cotton sail in place, each would launch his crude craft in the race down the relatively turbulent waters of the Provo River. We would run along the river's bank and watch the tiny vessels, sometimes bobbing violently in the swift current, and at other times sailing serenely as the water deepened. During such a race, we noted that one boat led all the rest toward the appointed finish line. Suddenly the current carried it too close to a large whirlpool and the boat heaved to its side and capsized. Around and around it was carried, unable to make its way back into the main current. At last it came to an uneasy rest at the end of the pool amid the flotsam and jetsam that surrounded it. The toy boats of childhood had no keel for stability, no rudder to provide direction, and no source of power. Inevitably, their destination was downstream, the path of least resistance. Unlike toy boats, we have been provided divine attributes to guide our journey. We enter mortality not to float with the moving currents of life, but with the power to think, to reason, and to achieve. We left our heavenly home and came to earth in the purity and innocence of childhood. Our heavenly Father did not launch us on our eternal voyage without providing the means whereby we could receive from him guidance to ensure our safe return. Yes, I speak of prayer. I speak, too, of the whisperings from that still, small voice within each of us. And I do not overlook the holy scriptures written by mariners who successfully sailed the seas. We, too, must cross. Individual effort will be required of us. What can we do to prepare? How can we assure a safe sailing to our desired destination? Our example in the race of life could well be our elder brother, even the Lord. As a small boy, he provided a watchword, wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? As a grown man, he taught by example, compassion, love, obedience, sacrifice, and devotion. To you and to me, his summons is still the same. Come, follow me. At some period in our mortal mission, there appears the faltering step, the wan smile, the pain of sickness, even the fading of summer, the approach of autumn, the chill of winter, and the experience we call death. Every thoughtful person has asked himself the question best phrased by Job of old, if a man die, shall he live again? Try as we may to put the question out of our thoughts, it always returns. Death comes to all mankind. It comes to the aged as they walk on faltering feet. Its summons is heard by those who have scarcely reached midway in life's journey. And often it hushes the laughter of little children. But what of an existence beyond death? Is death the end of all? We are aware from recorded scripture that while the body of Jesus was placed in the tomb, Christ himself preached to the spirits in prison. Peter declared, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. After the body of Jesus had lain in the tomb for three days, the spirit again entered, and the resurrected Redeemer walked forth, clothed with an immortal body of flesh and bones. The answer to Job's question, if a man dies, shall he live again, 
came when Mary and others approached the tomb and saw two men in shining garments who spoke to them. Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. As the result of Christ's victory over the grave, we shall all be resurrected. This is the redemption of the soul. Paul wrote, There are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is the celestial glory which we seek. It is in the presence of God we desire to dwell. It is a forever family in which we want membership. Such blessings are earned. A high report card of mortality qualifies us to graduate with honors. How grateful we should be that a wise creator fashioned an earth and placed us here with a veil of forgetfulness of our previous existence so that we might experience a time of testing, an opportunity to prove ourselves and qualify for all that God has prepared for us to receive. Clearly, one primary purpose of our existence upon the earth is to obtain a body of flesh and bones. We are here to gain experience that could only come through separation from our heavenly parents. In a thousand ways, we are privileged to choose for ourselves. Here we learn from the hard taskmaster of experience. We discern between good and evil. We differentiate as to the bitter and the sweet. We learn that decisions determine destiny. Paul taught the Philippians that man is called upon to work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. By obedience to God's commandments, we can qualify for that house spoken of by Jesus when he declared, In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am there ye may be also. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where do we go after this life? No longer need these universal questions remain unanswered. From the depths of my soul and in all humility, I testify to the truths which I have presented. Our Heavenly Father rejoices for those who keep his commandments. He is also concerned for the lost child, the tardy teenager, the wayward youth, the delinquent parent. Tenderly, he speaks to these and indeed to all. Come back, come up, come in, come home, come unto me.